Thank you. That was awesome. Modern controversies. When I researched modern controversies, they fell into two basic categories. There was the academic and intellectual, and then there was the practical. In the first category, you had things like social media activism, democracy in action, or the tyranny of the mob. Uh, things like, is nuclear energy a positive option? What about climate change? Not going there. Should schools be locked down already? Veganism, health solution, or hipster habit? But then there are also practical modern controversies. Like, when you put the toilet paper on the toilet paper roll, does the paper go out or in? Is two sinks full of water really needed for dishwashing? Is rinsing really required? Does sauce go in the fridge or can it go and stay on the shelf? Of the dishwasher, what goes in the top shelf and what goes in the bottom shelf? Basically, anything you have to work through when you first get married and realise that your wife does things differently than your mum. That is a practical modern controversy. But I am sure that in the ancient world, they didn't deal with the same controversies that we deal with, for example, with the toilet paper roll. And in a similar way, we don't deal with the controversies that they dealt with. See, we read these two uh, passages on the healing ministry of Jesus, and it doesn't seem that controversial to us. However, in the ancient time, what Jesus did here, what Jesus says, is extremely controversial. And we'll be unpacking that today. Today we are continuing in our series on Luke. Um, and it's interesting that this passage is in the middle of a transition. See, in chapter 4, Jesus does celebrated healings. In chapter 5, the healings start to raise religious questions. And finally, the healings in chapter 6 lead to serious opposition and eventually to a plot to kill Jesus. The rejection of Jesus is escalating in these chapters. Now, the Pharisees and religious leaders, their main problem with Jesus is that they viewed his attitude towards the law as being too lax, too liberal, too permissive. Jesus associated with prostitutes, with tax collectors, and other sinners, sinners far too frequently, far too freely. And as we will go on in Luke to see, in this passage, the rebellious, rebellious religious are arising. So we start the passage, verse 12. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. So Jesus is preaching, ministering, going from town to town, and there is a man with leprosy. Verse 12 says, covered with leprosy. But literally in the Greek, it is full of leprosy. So not a little leprosy, but a whole lot of leprosy. Like, it was immediately obvious to anyone that saw the man that he had leprosy. Well, let's say if you had Ebola, now hypothetically, if you had Ebola, you turned blue. And you were walking down the street and you saw a person who was blue. Then you would run the other way. Then you wouldn't just cross the road, you would avoid him at all costs. Because it was obvious that he had something dangerous and contagious. And that is the scenario with this man with leprosy. It is obvious that he is infected, obviously covered, and obviously in Jesus' path in some way. Now, when the Bible uses the term leprosy, it's a generic term for a skin disease. It would have included what we now know as leprosy. But it would have also included other skin disorders, disorders such as psoriasis. Now, at that time, they didn't have the medical knowledge to know which of these skin diseases were mild and curable and which were contagious and dangerous. So strict precautions were put in place across the board and the people were put into exile. Uh, according to the Old Testament, those with leprosy would have been quarantined outside the city or camp, uh, put in house arrest, self-isolation or lockdown as we currently call it. So not only was the man in pain, covered head to foot in constant soreness, but he was also treated as an outsider, as unwanted. And what's more is he could not continue in his worship with God. Having leprosy, he was not permitted to be in the synagogue, not permitted to go to the temple for sacrifices. And as a result, this didn't only just affect him physically, it didn't just affect him socially, 
but it also afflicted him spiritually. There was a heavy stigma was on him. Furthermore, it was also believed that the person with leprosy had sinned in some specific way, that their leprosy was a result of their sin. And that is kind of like saying that the coronavirus, COVID-19, is God's judgment on the world. And some people, unfortunately, in Christian circles have started to say this. Like, if I get coronavirus and I pass away, then it is because of a specific sin that I have done and God is judging me harshly for it. And we have seen this argument before. It happened in the 80s with the explosion of HIV AIDS, where some people in Christian circles were saying that this was God's judgment on the homosexual community. And it is unfair. And it is unbiblical. And it, per and it permits an untrue way of looking at God, an untrue understanding of God. That is not the case. When things like pandemics occur, it is because of we live in a fallen world. It's because of original sin. It's because of the sin that is everywhere, not necessarily the specific sin of one person. And we need to be careful when that argument arises. Okay, so the verse continues, verse 12. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. There is faith with this man with leprosy. Like he has seen or at least heard of the other things that Jesus had done. He knew as some of it, at least in some measure. And the logic is this. If Jesus can heal that guy, then Jesus can heal me. If Jesus has healed A, then Jesus can heal B. Another thing here though is that for the Jewish people, only God can heal leprosy. We see this in 2 Kings 5, where the king of Syria sends Naaman to the king of Israel for healing. And the king of Israel is outraged, saying that only God can cure a man with leprosy, which in the story, he inevitably does. But then in Jesus' healing the man with leprosy, it raises the idea again that we see confirmed in the next passage, that Jesus is God. In a sense, the man is saying, only God can cure leprosy. I believe you are God, ergo, vis-a-vis, -vis, concordingly, you can heal me from my leprosy. The leper doesn't ask Jesus to talk to God on his behalf, but rather he implies that Jesus himself has the pale power to heal. That is the faith of the man with leprosy. And then Jesus does the unexpected, and then Jesus does the controversial. Jesus touches the man with leprosy. Verse 13. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. The man shouldn't have been in their town. The man shouldn't have been on that street. The man should not have been anywhere near Jesus. In doing so, he's breaking all kinds of societal and covenantal rules. And when the unclean man, full of leprosy, when he approaches Jesus, Jesus should have recoiled. And he doesn't. He doesn't go out of his way to avoid him. He doesn't cross the road. He doesn't break out the hazmat suit. But rather he interacts with him, talks with him, touches him. You can imagine the Jewish crowd holding its breath, leaning back and screaming, No, don't let him touch you. Even the ancient Near East knew not to do what Jesus does. To do was to risk contamination. The man with leprosy had probably not been touched for years, if not decades, and would have craved physical intimacy of this kind. Can you imagine being in that situation and if physical intimacy was your main love language? It would have been horrible. That Jesus touched the leper is remarkable in view of popular belief and circumstances. But in doing so, Jesus is showing power and compassion. And it raises a point. Who is our unclean? Who are the people that we avoid? Whose texts we don't quite get around to answering? Whose invites we completely ignore until it's too late? Oh, sorry, didn't see it. Who are our unclean in society that we never come in contact with? Never converse with or communicate? Who is our unclean. Have you ever had a conversation with a homeless person? 
Do you know a person on Newstart? Do you care for people who have been in prison, the orphans, the widows? It's interesting, Jesus saw one who was uncleaned and touched him. Too often we as Christians, sometimes especially as Christians, see the unclean of our community and we walk the other way. We conveniently avert our eyes not to make eye contact, pretending for all purposes that they don't exist. Jesus stopped, talked, touched. And while I'm not encouraging the methodology of touching right now, the rest do remain true, particularly now. The unclean is touched by Jesus and healed immediately, gone straight away. Leprosy was contagious through touch. The idea here being that the man with leprosy's uncleanness should have touched and gone on to Jesus. But that's not what happens. Rather, Jesus' holiness leaks onto the man with leprosy and he is clean and he is healed. Jesus then tells him to go to the priest and offer sacrifices as Moses commanded. And this is in line with Leviticus 13, where if someone was exiled due to a skin condition, but it had gone away, before they could re-enter the community, they would go to the priest. The priest would examine them and then announce them clean or unclean. This was for formal approval and readmission into society, like getting a clean bill of health from your doctor before emerging from lockdown. I mean, before we were all in lockdown. The man goes off, but Luke adds one more bit to the story. Verse 15. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Due to this miracle, and many like it, the people and crowds flock around him, demanding more and more from him, and yet he finds space. He finds time out. He goes bush, goes to the once opened coffee shop with his journal and the Bible. He does downtime. He does quiet time. He does God and me time. And this is another mini application point for us too. That we, especially at the moment, would do likewise. One person, another person on Twitter noted that uh, right now feels like the first five minutes of a disaster movie. And I think they are right. And as we noted in Bible study, it is either extremely stressful because you have work and your work is going crazy trying to convert to how to work in the current context, or you don't have work and that is extremely stressful as well. There is a strain that we are currently going through, one that elevates the need and the importance to be spending time with Jesus to be spending time with our spiritual father. It's interesting, despite all the popularity in the crowds of people, Jesus didn't go on a speaking tour, seeking to speak in bigger and bigger auditoriums and stadiums. He didn't spend all his time seeking, assigning autographs. He didn't do more television interviews to expand his scope and popularity to get more followers and more likes and more views. Instead, he withdrew and prayed. May that be a model to us as well, particularly now. So that's the first story, the man with leprosy. And then there's the second story, the mate on the mat. Verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. The power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. So people are piling in. And not just any people. Jesus here in this passage is speaking to the elite of the religious Jewish elite. The Pharisees. The teachers of the law. The scribes. These are the holy men of Israel. The leaders. To put this in Baptist terms, it's like me being invited to speak at the annual uh, General Assembly. To put it in evangelical terms, it's like being invited to speak at a Gospel Coalition conference. To put it in Pentecostal terms, it's like being asked to speak at Hillsong Conference. Or in secular terms, being asked to speak at a G20 or in front of the United Nations. 
This is a big deal with a big audience. The leaders are curious, but also cautious. Who is this guy? Stuff is happening, but is he legit? And how does this affect me and my theology, my role, my rank, my status? Is God actually doing something new here, or is Jesus a con artist? That's the kind of idea as Jesus starts to speak. Now, I realise today we may have some kids with us uh, streaming the service as we're still working on our kids' ministry. Um, so I thought I would convert this story into a poem to make it, make it slightly more accessible. Uh, this is my creative writing yearning seeping out, so please bear with me. The mate on the map. The mates had a mate who was lame, couldn't stand, bound to a mat, couldn't walk, life was bland. But the mates had heard Jesus had been on a healing spree. He'd healed the blind, healed that dude with leprosy. So the mates think of Jesus, the rabbi, good teacher, that maybe he'd do his thing on their mate, heal this one, good healer. But arriving at the place, the room is jam-packed. No room for a man on a stretcher, no room for the mate on the mat. Group conference is held. Brainstorming happens. The man and the mat and ropes are fastened, hauled up on the roof, and a hole is made. Clay and straw removed, not needed today. The people below, confused at the dirt, falling from above, one guy got hurt. The, the man-sized hole created. The paralyzed man lowered. Jesus stopped teaching. The religious leaders glower. Your sins are forgiven. The teacher thus says, the Pharisees and scribes just shake their head. You can't say that, you heathen, blasphemer. Only God can forgive sins, you snake-skinned schemer. Which is easier, Jesus asked, forgiveness or healing. But to do it, prove a point, I'll do both, despite your thinking. To the man he said, rise, take your mat and go. And so he did, in front of all of them. This wasn't a show. The mate known to many stood up for the first time. The people were astonished beyond reason, beyond rhyme. The mates filled in the room, roof to the homeowner's delight. Their faith had made a difference to their mate that night. That's the story. But I want to go back and unpack it just a little. First, imagine if that was your home. You have Jesus the most popular rabbi in living memory, who is performing all kinds of amazing miracles, and he is in your house. It's the get of the century. And then all these people come in, and you quickly put away your crystal and lock up your royal Dalton figures. But it's okay, because you've got the elite of the religious Jerusalem in your house. And there's heaps of people, and it's crammed, and I honestly hope no one is sick. And furniture is being moved around. But this is huge. People will be talking about this event for years to come. This is massive. And you're standing there. And you're listening to Jesus. And that's when you feel a little dirt on your shoulder. That's strange. I'm sure I dusted. And then some more. And you look up and a hole is starting to appear over your head. And you don't want to make it a big deal. You don't want to bring shame on anyone. This is an honour-shame culture. But um, guys, I'm not sure I'm okay with this. And the hole just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Like it's no longer a hole, it's a cavern that has opened on your roof. And you're trying to remember what the weatherman said. Because if that impending storm does come, then you're in a lot of trouble. And you're looking at Jesus. And hopefully he's going to address it. Hopefully he's going to stop preaching and tell these guys to stop doing what they're doing. Um, please stop wrecking this guy's awesome, amazing and recently cleaned house. But he doesn't. He keeps on preaching. He sees it, but he's not stopping it. Oh, come on, Jesus, they're wrecking my place. Now they are lowering someone. It's a man on a stretcher. Hang on, wait a minute, I know this guy. It's the paralyzed dude from down the street. What are they trying to do? Now, in Mark's account of this story, in Mark chapter 2, verse 4, it says the men dug through the roof, i.e. dug a hole through the clay and straw that made up the roof. 
But Luke in this passage says opening in tiles. Now, what's going on here in this apparent contradiction? It's most likely that Luke puts it this way because he is trying to reach a Greco-Roman audience. And on their houses, they had tiles, not plain straw. So to make it more understandable to them, he uses such a term. But in the culture in Israel at that time, it's far more likely that it was made of clay and straw. All right, story time. If you go into the leech's household, uh, that is Eric and Lorraine, uh, parents of my wife, Liz, also meaning that they are parents-in-law, um, you will see a pristine house, a very clean house, a house with white carpet. Well, mostly white carpet. For if you look very particularly at a certain spot, you will note that it has a slight orange hue. Uh, this is because uh, when Eric and Lorraine were away, uh, a friend of ours was staying there. Now this is before Liz and I were dating, we were just friends at this time, way before we were married. And this friend had a group of people from the church over. And this group of people from the church over were drinking Fanta. And one guy with a cup of Fanta accidentally spilt the cup of Fanta onto the pristine white carpet. And try as they may, they could never fully get out that orange stain. They've done a really good job. You can hardly notice. But when I see it, it just makes me smile. Thankfully, I was not the guy with the cup of Fanta. I did not do the stain. But you can imagine how horrified those people were feeling, how mortified the person who was staying in that house was with a damp a nappy trying to clean up the orange and, and not uh, pressure, not, not pinch, not dab. That's how you get rid of stains. That feeling of mortification is probably only just a little thing compared to a guy <laughs> digging a hole in your roof. That would have been horrible. That would have been huge. So that, but that is what happens. And then Jesus addresses the lowered man. And you get the idea that the stretcher is not actually sitting on the ground yet. Like as the stretcher lowers, people had to kind of move away to allow room for the man on the stretcher to get there. Like a mate's kind of holding onto the rope and, and, and they've got the strength. They've already hauled him up. They've already dug a hole out of the roof and now they're holding ropes to allow their mate to get in front of Jesus while Jesus was talking. And Jesus does something completely unexpected. Remember, Jesus had the anointing of healing on him. He was healing people. And these mates had gone to so much trouble. The most predictable thing in this scenario is for Jesus to just heal the man. But he doesn't. Instead, he says, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, let's just pause there for a second. Before we go on, note that when Jesus saw their faith, not the paralyzed man's faith, but the faith of his friends that had gone to so much trouble, so much exertion to get their paralyzed friend in front of Jesus, that's the faith that is being referenced here. That is the faith that is making a difference. And there is something in that relation to the friends. Their love Care, concern, and compassion for the paralyzed man push them to physical and social extremes. Push them to think outside of the box. Push them to dig a hole in a roof. Their friend was suffering, but he did not suffer alone. His mates were with him. His mates looked after him. His mates supported him, and they did it together. One point must be brought out of this in our current times. For there are many in this situation right now with coronavirus who are suffering. And it's important that we come together and we suffer together. That we go the long distance to look after each other and to support each other in this difficult time. That we do physical and social exertion to look after those who are suffering in our community and in our society right now. I spoke about this next story in the update uh, this week, uh, but for those who didn't see it, I think it bears repeating. This week we had Paul Newton's internment service, which is where we buried his ashes in Rookwood Cemetery. I was speaking to Kim, and she noted that she had set a challenge for herself, 
to ring someone at church every day. And I love that idea. And I want to set it for us as a church too. That we would ring, message, email, text, FaceTime or Zoom conference call someone from the church every day this week. For this is a time where people are isolated and suffering. But as we see from the model of the mates, it is not something that needs to be done alone. Will you take up the Kim challenge with us to ring and connect to someone in our church every day? To care for them, to support them in this difficult time. Like the mates cared, loved their paralyzed friend. But back to the controversy. Jesus says, friends, your sins are forgiven. Now, Jesus says nothing about the man's legs or paralysis. Nothing about the fact that he couldn't move or walk. Nothing about his physical incap- incapacitations. None of that. He focused on the man's soul. And he forgives the man's sins. And the audience did not like that one bit. Verse 21. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, remember who is in the room. The Jewish elite, the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law, the holy men of Israel. And unsurprisingly, they have a theological objection to this spiritual assertion of forgiveness. The religious leaders object You can't say that. Harold from Neighbours comes out again. And in one sense, they are right. God is the only one who can forgive sins. But what they are missing, what they are refusing to get, grasp and grapple, is that Jesus is God. Only God can forgive sins, but Jesus is God. So, ergo, vis-a-vis, concordingly, Jesus can forgive sins. But they are not willing to accept that. Unwilling to believe that Jesus is God, they are not there yet. And in fact, most of them never get there. They can overlook the healing, but to forgive sins, only God can do that. So then how will Jesus respond to their objections? Maybe thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening. Maybe the almighty smiter will smite. It's good that we are not Jesus. I'm just saying lightning bolts would be a much more used tool in my toolbox if that was the case. Maybe Jesus will debate the point and enter into a theological argument with theological words. He does not. But instead, Jesus responds in an object lesson. Now, an object lesson is where you want to teach something, but rather than doing it with your words, you do it through an activity, through an exercise. I'll give you an example. Currently, we are homeschooling our three kids. And I say we, but we all know that basically means Liz. And Liz was teaching the kids outer space. And so Grace became the sun. Josh was the earth. And Sam was the moon. And Josh rotated around Grace. And and, and then uh, Josh, uh, and Sam rotated around Josh. And so it was like the moon rotating around the earth, which rotated around the sun, and it made a physical And it made it practical. And the kids understood it a lot more. And so then Jesus here does an object lesson, a practical activity to teach a theological point. Verse 23 and 24. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus is saying, you say I can't forgive sins. Well, what is easier? To forgive sins or to make the lame walk? The implication being that it's way easier to say sins are forgiven, but to show you I am who I say I am. To show you that I am God, I will do this object lesson. Arise, take up your bed, and go home. And immediately he does. And immediately the friends breathe a sigh of relief, take a break and then start figuring out how to fix up the roof. The paralyzed man obeys and walks. And doing so, Jesus proves that he can, in fact, forgive sins, that he can, in fact, do the harder, visible thing. The miracle points to the truth of who Jesus is. 
that Jesus is God, that Jesus can forgive sins. In his holiness, Christ doesn't just chase away our sins. Jesus forgives the sinner, forgives, wipes away, wipes clean, completely sanitizes. It's really interesting then how pe the people respond to this. Verse 26, everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. It's funny. They watched Jesus prove that he could forgive sins by healing a paralyzed man. But not one of them is recorded to, have, uh, to then go up to Jesus and say, since you can forgive sins, Jesus, forgive my sins too. They were amazed, but they gave general praise. But they did not worship. They did not repent. They did not seek forgiveness. Forgive my sins too. Wipe my sins clean. They did not say that. That did not happen. Having ears, they did not hear. They did not get it. As a preacher, I sometimes get people uh, telling me it was a good sermon, uh, which is lovely to hear. But the praise I desire much more, the thing that is a far greater compliment to me as a preacher, more significant, is when someone comes up to me and says, I've been really challenged by what you have said today. Challenged to change, challenged to do something different. I felt the Spirit convict me by what you said, and that is the gold as a preacher. Far more than, that was a good servant and you made me laugh. Though let's be honest, I appreciate that as well. These Jewish religious leaders had a good general theology, but they do not know Jesus. They do not allow this teaching, this object lesson to impinge their soul. They do not allow it in. They refuse to believe. They refuse to accept. They don't really get it. And as a result, they are not changed. Jesus forgives. They didn't get it. Jesus forgives us. Do we get it? Do we live in light of the forgiveness of Christ earned by his death and resurrection? Uh, one commentary tells a story uh, that the head of a psychiatric department uh, had a patient who was from Vietnam and had been non-functioning for years. In the course of his Vietnam duties, he had been responsible for the death of many people. The hospital staff felt convinced that his illness was the result of an inability to forgive himself. One day the doctor came in and asked uh, to see this particular patient. He went into the man's room, sat on his bed and said, I want to tell you your sins are forgiven. The man was like, but what? The doctor continued, I have the authority to tell you through Jesus Christ that your sins are are forgiven. That exchange marked the beginning of a healing and the patient is now back in functioning society. I think that can be our danger and tendency too. That we hold on to our sins, that we grip our sins in a vice-like tension, uh, in a hold that cannot be loosened. And we don't fully accept that Jesus has accepted has given our sins. accept that Jesus has wiped us clean, that we hold on to our past flaws and grievances and won't let them go. But we need to hear this message too, that Jesus forgives us, that Jesus wipes us clean, that Jesus has the power to forgive. And if you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, you are forgiven. May we accept that like the paralyzed man. Please let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for this time. Thank you for this ability to come together as a church, worship in community and hear the, your teaching. We pray, Lord, that you may challenge us. We pray, Lord, that you would change us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us spend time with you in this difficult circumstance. We pray, Lord, that you will help us serve and love those in the community, those who we have previously considered unclean. But Lord, we also pray that we will come uh, to face you as the forgiver of our sins. That we would accept our identity as forgiven, as cleaned, as washed away. 
that we will lo uh, loosen our grip on those sins that we refuse to let go of. That you will help us, learn, Lord, own our identity as forgiven, for you are the one who forgives. In your name, amen.